beautiful river. It has all the requisites for a large settlement. Settlement came. First mission, San Gabriel in 1771. Then on September 4, 1781, oblivious to an American revolution a continent away, El Pueblo de la Reina de Los Angeles was founded. Sixty-five years later, Pueblo L.A. sits for its first portrait, an isolated Mexican outpost, population 3,500. In the mid-19th century, Southern California was divided into less than 200 cattle ranches. It was a gracious but feudal society, supported by Native American labor. California cowboys, vaqueros, stand as romantic symbols of this long-lost layer of L.A.'s past. A world overrun in 1850, when American Manifest Destiny claimed California as the 31st state. American L.A. poses for its first known photograph, taken on a quiet 1860s afternoon. A deceptively tranquil image of a Wild West town that boasted a murder a night. A visiting Easterner expressed a typically American mix of moral outrage and optimism. This city of the angels is anything else, unless the angels are fallen ones. But Americans are pouring in, and in a few years we'll make a beautiful place of it. Upon first impression in the mid-19th century, the place may have looked promising, but the odds were against it. Cut off by mountains and deserts, the L.A. area was isolated. An island on land, writer Helen Hunt Jackson called it. Unlike most great cities, there was no natural harbor, just a marshy bay, and not even a navigable river for transportation and trade. Worse, the water supply was limited. The area's only advantages were seductive climate, expanses of open land, and most important, good fortune to emerge during an American technological revolution. In the 1860s and 70s, when the telegraph and steam locomotive forged a lifeline with the East, L.A. quickly added another layer to its changing identity, Boomtown. In the 1880s, American advertising and mass media packaged Southern California and sold it like patent medicine. The Victorian steeple on the old Plaza Church was only one sign that Yankees were eager to make Los Angeles their own, ignoring the Hispanic past and transforming the landscape along the way. First came a harbor, man-made in the 1890s. It eventually opened the city to the rest of the world. Thomas Edison's latest technological marvel, the motion picture camera, captured the city's Yankee ingenuity at work. Edison's invention also preserved these rare images of Spring Street in 1898, L.A.'s first home movies. Los Angeles was a bustling little town of 100,000, only one-third the size of turn-of-the-century San Francisco, but its growth had been explosive, increasing almost a hundredfold in 50 years. Yet one obstacle could bring it all to an end lack of water. Again, Los Angeles took advantage of American technology. In 1905, the city committed to one of the most ambitious engineering feats of modern time. An aqueduct to be cut and threaded through 233 miles of mountains and desert. It would take eight years to build.
When the valves were first opened in the hills of the San Fernando Valley, legendary city engineer William Mulholland made a typically terse Yankee speech. There it is. Take it. With water, the future of Los Angeles seemed secure, but turn-of-the-century America was in turmoil. After decades of robber baron capitalism, social experimentation was in the air. Activists were redefining the American dream, and Los Angeles would be a testing ground. On the surface, the city seemed a fledgling paradise, but not everyone was receiving their fair share of America's blessings. When unionism challenged the city establishment, battle lines were drawn. On one side, Harrison Gray Otis, visionary patriarch of the Los Angeles Times and virulent anti-unionist. On the other side, union organizers, some driven to try anything. On October 1st, 1910, union radicals struck. When the smoke cleared, the headquarters of the Times was rubble and 20 employees were dead. The aftershocks left lasting impressions. There's violence in the layers of LA's past. When the American dream seems close, the search can turn desperate. Fourth generation Angelino and former Times publisher Otis Chandler remembers his grandfather, Harry. I uh, remember going to visit my grandfather in his office as a young boy, 10 years old and uh, he told me something about the bombing and then he reached behind his desk in a hidden closet. It was a, uh, looked like the wall, but it's a secret compartment. He pressed the wall and out popped uh, the door and inside the door, inside the cabinet there was a sawed off eight gauge shotgun. And he said, this is what I have if they ever try it again. Um, so it was a very big thing to my father and grandfather, that whole episode. Harry Chandler's generation of white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant businessmen boosters would lead Los Angeles for decades to come, and the city prospered. Most history books were written to record their triumphs, but there are overlooked layers of L.A.'s past and unsung heroes. This is Los Angeles' first census, a list of the pobladores, the city's 44 founders, colonists from Mexico. They are a surprisingly diverse group, an intermingling of Native American, black, and Spanish backgrounds. Reminders of LA's Hispanic heritage are everywhere, but romantic myths sometimes obscure a true appreciation of Mexican contributions to Southern California. A celebration of Hispanic America is at the heart of the work of playwright Luis Valdez. I was aware of Los Angeles as a Mexican place in addition to being an American place, almost from the very beginning, because the names were in fact familiar. San Fernando was San Fernando, you know, and um, it addressed itself in, in a very direct way to a history that I, I long to know and to study, and I have over the years. I've become very familiar with it. I, I breathe the, the history of Los Angeles. The city itself, Los Angeles, uh, became uh, a magical place. All my life it's exerted its magic pull on me, as it has over the entire world, I think. El Pueblo in downtown Los Angeles is a reminder of more than the city's Mexican past. Fifty years ago, El Pueblo was the heart of the city's Chinatown. Asian immigration to Los Angeles dates back to the mid-19th century. Chinese helped build the railroads that fed Southern California's prosperity. And Japanese made major contributions to the region's great agricultural marketplace. Asian immigrants came to the West Coast looking for economic opportunity. Many found a fresh start, but not without a fight.
The worst came during World War II, when Japanese Americans were deprived of their civil rights and sent to internment camps. Sue Embry was born and raised in Los Angeles. I was listening to Al Jarvis, the disc jockey, and they broke in to announce that Hawaii's Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and they thought they were Japanese planes. But it became evident that it was the Japanese, and by dark, a lot of the FBI agents were already in Little Tokyo arresting many of the leaders, the Buddhist priests, the school teachers, leaders of the Chamber of Commerce. And I remember crying very hard that morning uh, when I left. And I was leaving a lot of people behind. I was leaving a lot of memories behind. And, uh, and I think all of us felt that maybe we might never be able to come back. And this was probably our last, uh, our last view of, of Los Angeles. It would be three long years before many of LA's Japanese Americans returned to rebuild their lives. They found their city filled with more newcomers than ever before. Southern California's black community in particular was burgeoning.